Hey everybody, Dr. Dan here. Welcome back. So this is the chapter 15 um, recording, which is for module seven. And this covers a little bit of chapter 14 also because we have a quiz this week and there are questions from chapter 14 and from chapter 15. And this is gonna be a long lecture, unfortunately. I'll try to get it done in under like, well, under 20 minutes for sure, but hopefully under 16 minutes. And and uh, I'm gonna intersperse the quiz questions in between, in throughout the lecture. Um, not to make you watch it all, but just because I can address them better when I get to that part in the book. Um, I know some of you just wanna you know, get the answers, take the quiz, get through the class and not listen to this. And that's fine, uh, but this is, this is an important chapter. I mean, it's got the American Revolution and the Haitian Revolution. And uh, if you listen, I think you'll actually learn some things. So, you know, in addition to the, uh, to the quiz. So let's go ahead and get started. Before I get started on chapter 15, I'm sure you all watched the chapter 14 video. Uh, but if you didn't, I covered a couple of things on that video that are gonna be on the quiz this week. So from chapter 14, uh, there's a question about um, why the scientific revolution and the enlightenment uh, didn't take off in the Middle East or China like it did in the West, in Europe, okay? So uh, that is somewhere around page 580 in your book. And uh, the thing to look for there is, you know, generally these new ideas that people have are always uh, frowned upon by the people who hold knowledge, which in this case was, um, in the case of, of uh, like the Middle East, was the Islamic rulers. And so they kind of clamped down on knowledge and similar situation in China. So that's why uh, scientific inquiry didn't always spread um, like it did in the West. So that's from chapter 14 and there's a similar question on the quiz in chapter 15 about industrialization like that, that I'll cover. And then also from chapter 14, um, there was a question about uh, John Locke and uh, his idea of the social contract. And if you remember Locke on 584, 585, the Enlightenment thinkers, and he was the guy who came up with the idea of the social contract, which is really the basis for our democracy. The social contract says that um, you know, leaders, whoever's in charge, you know, they're contractually bound to the citizens they serve and the citizens can change the government at any time, either by voting people out of office or by revolt or revolution or overthrow or whatever. So, so social contract is very important because it's the basis for our democracy. But as far as the quiz question is concerned, social contract does something else. At the time, kings were in charge, right? And they had no, you know, they had no special authority over you or me. So what Locke did with the idea of a social contract is that he challenged the divine right of kings, all right? And that's really the quiz answer you want to look for because, you know, before even the American Revolution, you know, King George is in charge of England and is in charge of the colonies where, where we live now, for example. And, uh, you know, he was only a king because he said, hey, God made me king. You know, a rich family took over way back when is what really happened. So uh, John Locke came along and said, hey, kings don't have any divine rights. There's no connection to God, you know, with a king any more than there's a connection to God with, you know, with me. So uh, that's why that's important, and that's from 14. Okay, so I've used up four minutes, so let's get on to chapter 15 real quick uh, and kind of look at the big themes, and, and I'll go through them, and uh, we can talk about the biggies. So, um, you know, the, the, the chapter outline here is, is pretty straightforward. Uh, new languages of freedom, political reorderings, uh, change in trade in Africa, economic reorderings, and, and sort of the biggies are the revolutions and, and really more of this idea of, uh, of uh, enlightenment and the press and how ideas travel. Uh, so, so what's going on is in this chapter, and let me just kind of click through here uh, to the notes, and also I'm kind of looking at uh, the questions at the same time. Okay, so so one of the things the chapter starts with are these new ideas, sort of a continuation from last chapter, and one of them is popular sovereignty, and that just is a fancy way of of democracy. You know, the people should have a voice in things. So popular sovereignty means the popular vote 
should have their way, okay? So popular sovereignty comes up with this idea that there's a people, you and me, the voters, we the people. It sort of relates to nationalism. Um, and, and so popular sovereignty was really the basis of this idea that power resides in the people, okay? So know what that is. It's a real important concept. Um, you know, and it works, it works both ways. You know, during the times of slavery, like in Kansas, when Kansas was, I'm off track, sorry, but when Kansas was deciding whether to be a slave or a free state, the way they decided was by popular sovereignty, okay? They voted, hey, you know, this many people wanted it to be a slave state, this many people wanted it to be a free state, and that happens all the time, that sort of stuff. So know what popular sovereignty is, sorry for the Kansas reference, and then, um, but more important, know what free trade is or, or laissez-faire, uh, because free trade is really important. It, it regulates capitalism, all right? And, and it doesn't regulate capitalism. It says that regulation is bad, actually. But it's the idea that, of capitalism that if I have something you want to buy, you should be able to buy it from me and vice versa. If I want to make things that I want to sell to people, I should be able to do that with as little restriction as possible. So free trade is really the basis of the United States and capitalism and all of Western Europe and most of the world. Uh, even China. I mean, we freely trade with China to the extent we can, but there are regulations on trade, so it's not totally free. But the concept itself of free trade came up during this period of time. We talked a little bit about Adam Smith, the great economist last time, very tied in with this idea. And know what free trade is, this freedom to do business with each other like you and I can do uh, today. So that's an important concept. And uh, I think there's a question on here, not yet. Uh, okay, so, but the other thing is that this chapter again opens with the printing press. So there is a question about the press and not so much the physical press itself, but information. Because why is the printing press a big deal? Why are we talking about it? Because it spreads information. The entire modern world that we live in right now, the reason that people question the divine right of kings and the reason that people were able to make boats a few chapters ago and the reason people can trade is all because of information. And, and you know, I, I can't enforce the importance of the printing press enough. It's, you know, it's way more important than the internet. I mean, but I want you to think in terms of internet because that's what you grew up with. But imagine a world with no information, no internet, and no books. So at the time, newspapers... Um, pamphlets, whatever, broad, broad sheets were just sheets of paper, you know, people, um, uh, you know, um, handed out out on the street. That was the internet of the day. That was the email of the day. That's how information was distributed. And the reason I make a big deal out of it in this chapter is because before printing, there was no distribution of information. So if someone said, hey, the king's related to God, you'd say, okay, well, I don't know anything else. I mean, people just basically didn't know stuff. So that's why... Printing's important, and the big thing about printing, again, kind of related to the internet and the democratization of information, if you will, is that as the cost of printing went down in the late 1700s, all right, it made ideas and information more accessible to people. So that is a question on the quiz you need to know, and it's really important because right around the end of the 1700s, when the cost of printing goes down, what happens? revolutions increase, all right? The American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Haitian Revolution, the revolutions in South America. This all happens because people start to get ideas because they start to read. And so you need to know that it's really important and it's also important to know that information can be very influential on how you vote, how you think and everything else. And that's what's happening here in this history. So it's pretty cool to understand that. That's a quiz question, again, the cost of printing goes down, so when that happens, um, uh, seditious ideas, uh, uh, ideas that maybe uh, buck the norms are more available than ever before. So check that out on page 609 because you'll be asked that on the quiz. And okay. And let me keep going. So yeah, the cost of information goes down, so people get new ideas. And when people get new ideas, what happens? They question the authority of where they're living. So the North American War for Independence, also known as the American Revolution, kind of a specialty of mine, but, but we're not here to talk about that very much. But I think most of you know the program there. Um, um, you know, the colonies are, are grooving over here in North America, doing their own thing. And England's in charge, King George, right? 
And, um, you know, all of a sudden Parliament says, that's the English Parliament, the English, English Congress, if you will, says, hey, we need money. Let's tax, uh, let's tax the colonies because we took care of them uh, when, the, when the French were trying to attack them and other stuff. So there are colonies, we're going to tax them. So the first tax comes down is the Stamp, the stamp Act. And uh, the colonists here in, in North America are upset because they don't have representation in Parliament. You always heard that taxation without representation. The Boston Tea Party, all that stuff happens. So that's the first major revolution in the late 1700s. You know, obviously the Americans won. I mean, we are here. So there's that part, Boston Massacre, all that stuff. Um, and then the other revolution is the French Revolution, which um, if you're not a, a, um, a student of the French Revolution, it's, uh, it's actually a pretty fun, it's a pretty cool revolution. I, I won't get into it, but basically uh, the French revolted against the king, King Louis XVI, because, uh, because King Louis XVI spent a lot of money and he needed to go to the Estates General, that's like their Congress, for the first time in like 400 years and raise taxes. Well, once he did that, people were like, hey, why are we spending all this money? And that's sort of the real basis for the French Revolution. There's a lot more to it than that. It was incredibly bloody, uh, but it happened in 1789 after our revolution. And it was even upsetting to, like Thomas Jefferson here supported it, uh, because he was all about the people rising up against the government, but the Federalists, like uh, you know Hamilton, they were in Washington. They were scared to death of revolutions like this. So the French Revolution was the other big one, but the one we should talk about more so uh, is the Haitian Revolution um, in in Saint Domingue, which is now Haiti. And and the reason that's an important one to read about, and there's a great little video here you can watch, is because it's the first successful. A slave revolution where slaves rose up against their masters. And at that time, uh, Saint Domingue, or I'm just going to call it Haiti because that's what it became after the revolution, uh, you know, was a French owned uh, slave state. It was brutal. And uh, as you read through, you'll see that the slaves rose up uh, against their French masters. And there's a question about this um, uh, in the quiz, a, a question, I think it's called irony. And uh, what it is, is that um, right here, and it's highlighted, the enslaved in Haiti, when they rose up against their French masters, they used the slogans that came right out of the French Revolution, liberty, equality, and fraternity, uh, to then to announce their masters. So, so actually, the Haitian slaves were actually taking the, um, the spirit and even the sayings from the, from the French revolutions that their masters were in, uh, to revolt against their masters. So there's a certain irony there. And that message of freedom um, from Haiti, uh, when other slaves in North America and throughout the Caribbean in Jamaica, you know, found out that the Haitians rose up against their masters, uh, there were slave revolts, uh, you know, everywhere. Even in Florida, there was a successful slave result, resort where some Spanish slave holders got, uh, uh, actually got, drove out to sea by the enslaved after the Haitian Revolution. So, so uh, it's real important. Most people don't know about it, but it's like the first and only um, slave revolt, and, which resulted in the slaves uh, you know, taking over the island a long time ago. So that's, that's Haiti, and it's important. And uh, just remember that quiz question. And then let's see here, what else do we have? There is a question about China. We're not there yet. Uh, other revolutions. So, you know, there was slavery in South America, but there really wasn't a, um, a civil war like there was in the U.S. Uh, but there were revolutions in Brazil uh, against uh, Portugal in the early 1800s. So, again, we start to see these, these colonial holdings, these early colonial holdings uh, collapse as uh, as people grow um, into a state of of liberalism in the sense that they want independence and all of that is because of the press and the fact that uh, printing is going crazy and information is getting spread everywhere so all of that ties together uh, talks about mexico's independence i won't get into that i'm at 14 minutes and i'm going to try to go really quick um, make a note in africa you know no one ever talks about africa in this period since you know, the slave trade is sort of gone. So, but keep in mind, the slave trade ends in, in Europe and France and, and in the U.S. 
uh, as far as you know, the importation of slaves from Africa in the early 1800s, like 1808, I think. And um, uh, so think about that. These Africans were getting rich selling slaves, selling their own, and now all of a sudden that industry has stopped. And so it's interesting to read about what happened in Africa because the wealthy Africans no longer made their money from selling slaves, but now Africans were exploited in a different way because the way they made money typically uh, was exporting things like palm oil and diamonds and gold and that sort of stuff, which was brutal. So slavery in Africa increased, Africans enslaving Africans during this period of time because um, their income sort of switched from the slave trade to the slave or to the trade of commodities. So just an interesting thing that you probably didn't know. Um, and then finally, let me just go through here. We're going to talk about the Industrial Revolution, and I'm going to take a few minutes on that. Um, interesting thing here, how fashion becomes more popular in this era because there's more sophisticated fabrics. I mean, cottons, uh, dyed cottons, cottons with uh, fabric or with patterns, those types of things were never available before. Well, now slowly uh, they're starting to be able to become available. So, you know, as a status thing, people are starting to dress up. There's another big theory that says as mirrors were invented and widely distributed, people could see themselves for the first time. Um, so they started to dress differently too. And there's something to that, especially in the U.S. So read about that. And so what we're talking about here is all this fabric and clothing and trade is that the Industrial Revolution is happening. So uh, Industrial Revolution, long and short of it is, it just means mass production, commodities. Now all of a sudden cotton fabric is available you know, everywhere to everybody. Not quite like today, but kind of getting there. Uh, there's no Amazon <laughs> yet. Um, so, so, but fabrics being made, it's being distributed all over and England rises as, you know, as the big leader in industrialization in the early 1700s. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One of them is that they have coal and they have iron ore and they have water and they have labor all really kind of close together. So it makes sense if you have all the raw materials you need to make steel, iron, and to manufacture stuff. If you have all the raw materials and the labor all in one place, then it makes sense that, that you're going to be able to do that. Uh, if you don't have all of those raw materials, you know, that's not going to work for you. So England was one of the first to really uh, uh, mechanize things, invent the, the spinning jenny and the automatic loom. Uh, and to harness coal power, the first steam engines were made in England. You know, they ran factories right away. I mean, in, inventions are made because people want to make money. So the invention of the steam engine and all this automation, sorry, my leg is itching, that's why I'm scratching, um, is, is the reason that uh, industrialization started there. And there's a question about, hey, why didn't industrialization or the Industrial Revolution happen in China? And the answer is they didn't have uh, cheap fuel. I mean, China has coal, but not much of it. It's way up north, and the industrial section is in the south. So uh, China didn't have cheap fuel. Now, there were a number of other reasons China wasn't uh, uh, part of the Industrial Revolution back then. Uh, but the main reason was they didn't have the coal to power anything, and, and that's important. Cheap carbon is very important. So that's a question on the quiz. Make sure you cover that or you know that one. And I think that's about it because I'm at 18 minutes. So... We covered all the quiz questions. This is a great chapter because it covers the Industrial Revolution. It talks about all the changes that go on. And one of the things that's going to happen is as these countries get hungry for raw materials, all right, that's called, you know, we're going to start to learn about new imperialism that starts to happen in the, you know, 1800s. And as these countries start to get hungry for raw materials, what are we going to see? We're going to start to see some, some disputes but more so with industry, we invent industrial weapons for the first time. So now we're going to see the rise of industrial warfare, uh, even in Napoleon's times. Uh, but even later, we're going to see industrial warfare expand. And we're also going to see imperialism and warfare come together as we get into the first world wars and some of the other global conflicts uh, next time. And I think we're on spring break next week. I'm not sure on my dates because I'm recording this ahead of time. Uh, but be safe. If you have any questions, let me know. 
And uh, remember, the quiz is uh, open book and no time limit. So take your time, uh, look through everything, and you'll do just fine. Have a great day. Be safe. Go Rockets.